Well, thank you so much to A4LE for the opportunity to present at this virtual conference. Uh, I was really looking forward to being able to present in person uh, for North Carolina and South Carolina A4LE conferences and, and meeting some new faces and being able to say hi to old friends. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy to be a participant and a presenter for this conference. So thank you very much for the inclusion in this. Um, I'm Becky Brady. I'm a senior architect at Clark Nexon. I've been with Clark Nexon for about 14 years, and I have a passion in working on K-12 projects and specifically studying school safety. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. We'll get my presentation pulled up and get rolling. So today we're talking about the value of outdoor environments and enhancing health, well-being, and safety for students and teachers. So our learning objectives, which are really encompassed here in the agenda. So we'll talk about school safety kind of in general, a really high level view of what school safety is. Um, we'll talk about the nature deficit disorder and then outdoor education, play, experience and exposure and how it can help to, to counteract some of the effects of the nature deficit disorder. And then we'll look at a case study of a school that is implementing uh, some some really good practices and being really successful with their outdoor environments. But before I dive into everything, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. So it was a snowy spring day when time stopped and my life changed in 2007 on the campus of Virginia Tech. I was in my fifth year of architecture school and I was finishing up my degree with a minor in French. On that tragic day, I lost 32 fellow students to the hands of a senseless act, including former classmates and a former French professor. Sometimes it's these tragic events that motivate us to pursue solutions, and that is what this experience has really done for me. Fast forward a few years, and now I have two daughters. You can see them in this picture here. Um, and they're in public school, and I don't want to think twice when I'm dropping them off at school in non-COVID times when we're actually going to school, uh, but when I drop them off for the day, I don't want to think twice about it. And for those of you who are parents, I know you can relate. As an architect, I also really care about the design of a building. I care about what it looks like. Um, so my goal through my research and presentations is to help promote safety in good school designs. So looking at safety in schools, I think the first thing that everybody kind of thinks of is a mass shooter, but what we really want to do is look at safety in all aspects. So we're talking about student fights, bullying, which is in person or cyber bullying, um, self harm, natural disasters, violence from family strife. Of course, we are talking about the active shooter as well. And in more recent discussions and what we're living out now is the global pandemic. So how how are all of these things uh, being counteracted with uh, safety measures. So while the occurrence of mass shootings has not risen substantially since the 1990s, the availability of media introduces a dramatic change on how prevalent the information is, meaning that everyone knows about the events as soon as they happen, and then there are, they're faced with these images of the events for much longer periods of time on the news and on social media platforms. But what we found is through surveys of superintendents across America and through just research um, and, and certain white papers that have been published that bullying is the most prevalent concern of school safety. Uh, at the time of Columbine back in 1999, 71% of attackers in school shootings had been bullied and that percentage has risen ever since then. Uh, the attackers are much more likely to have been bullied than to be the bully. And nearly 50% of homicide perpetrators gave some type of warning signal, such as making a threat or leaving a note before the event, according to the CDC. So in this graph at the top of this slide, what's really scary is that, uh, you know, this is listing the number of active shooters and not active shooters uh, by year since 1970 up to the present day. So you can see that in the past few years, there may have been a small actual active shooting events, but look at the possibility of what could have happened. These were these were non active shooters, so this means that there were there were guns, but they weren't active. So if a situation with bullying, if it escalates, what could have happened in those situations? So what we're really trying to do is look at all of these things together and how can we prevent 
uh, some of these situations from happening. So looking kind of big picture down at school safety, uh, what are some things that we can do talking about architecture specifically and designing of buildings? We can streamline entrances. We can make sure that there are um, vestibules, there are controlled entries, and that there are secured um, egress paths. So you don't have people coming in at all points of the campus. There should be one point of entry for any visitors, anyone who's not uh, a, a normal person who is coming onto the campus on a daily basis. And then I think our gut reaction is really to hunker down after, after a big event happens. Um, and, and really kind of close in, uh, limit glazing. But what research is telling us is that we really need to open up and create lines of visibility, uh, making sure that we have clear sight lines throughout the site and uh, through the building. Providing wider corridors and stairs, giving students plenty of space to pass by each other in the hallways so that um, you know a chance encounter doesn't happen where someone someone's backpack unintentionally hits someone else and then something could arise from there. Um, the code mandates that you have to have at least a six foot corridor in an educational facility, but I think we can all agree that we need more than six feet for today's students. Uh, create some neutral learning commons as available places for students to be during the day. These are more relaxed. These are between class times or maybe it's a breakout area for a class to go, um, but creating that place for them to really just take a breath uh, in between their more rigid classes and then making schools community centric. So how, what are the layers of the school? Can we can we create some smaller groups so that people don't just feel like a number at a large school, but they feel like a person who is valued? And then looking at um, just having a conversation. If, if you're an adult or a parent, have a conversation with a student, get to know them kind of on a more personal level, um, check the climate of your school. Is it a school that you would want to go to? Is it a school that you would want your child to go to? Um, thinking on a on a personal note, one day I emailed my teacher's daughter, or excuse me, my daughter's teacher to apologize for some background noise in her virtual classroom when my dogs were just running amok. And he responded back to say that it was no problem and he called my dogs by name, Penny and Greta. And I can't tell you how much that meant to me because I didn't say what my dog's names were but I knew that that meant that he was listening to my daughter. And this is in the world of um, virtual classrooms. So he is, he's making a point to listen to students and get to know them on a more personal level. Um, and then just simply show kindness. Um, students are learning by examples. So if we as adults are showing kindness to each other, that's what they're going to pick up on. And then focusing a little bit more on the outdoors, we want to carefully consider site design and connect to the outdoors. So what we recommend at Clark Nexon is to follow the SEPTED principles, um, design a physical environment that positi positively influences human behavior with crime prevention through environmental design. So a few years ago, uh, some of you may remember because you may be on the A4LE listserv, A4LE had requested volunteers to participate in a national task force to study school safety and update their best practices guide. The original best practices guide was a direct response to the event that occurred at Sandy Hook in 2013. And while that document was uh, really good, it contained a lot of good information, it was only about 16 pages long and it only the surface of some of the major factors of school safety. It studied more technical aspects of school, including infrastructure and crisis communications, staffing and procedures, but it didn't include design factors. So this group was really put together to kind of look at four different categories, educators, students and community, school facilities, preparedness and response, and policy and procedure. And with each of these four categories, there were subcategories and the one that I was a part of was under educators, students and community, and it was outdoor environments. So here is a staggering fact with the nature deficit disorder. So more than 50% of people now live in urban areas and by 2050, this proportion will be 70%. So urbanization is growing at a staggering rate and it's correlating with the impact of the nature deficit disorder, which is linked with a growing number of diagnosis of mental disorders. And because this is happening so quickly, we don't know the full effect of, of what this is doing to both adults and students. Um, but how can we 
take this information and how can we help students move away from screens toward fulfilling a need of interacting with nature? And a big answer of that is um, with schools. So in a typical non-COVID world, students spend majority of their daylight hours at school um, and benefits uh, with school can happen through four key areas, through education, play, experience, or exposure. So here's one way to look at it. If you're so inclined, this is really kind of one end of the spectrum. It's a little extreme, but there are these places, um, they're forest kindergartens, and they're, they're comprised out of this idea that came from Germany where um, these schools spend all their time outdoors. Um, you drop your child off at a location, and then that's where they are for the day. Rain or shine, uh, 70 degrees or 30 degrees. They're child inspired and child directed. Uh, so that might not be a practical solution for everyone, but I think there are some practical solutions that we can use in, in every school. So looking at outdoor education, uh, it really benefits both students and teachers. It engages multiple learning styles. Uh, it has better behavior, happier teachers, and job satisfaction if you can move a classroom outdoors. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be every day, um, but you know, giving that opportunity when the weather is nice, uh, if you have a, a nice outdoor learning environment, or even if you don't, if there's some way to move a classroom outside, um, that's really, it's a great way to kind of start to break barriers. Uh, it fosters communities and it cre creates those layers of belonging and stronger interpersonal relationships. It's a more relaxed environment, it's less rigid, so teachers seem to be more approachable in the eyes of students. And then students can start forming those relationships with a trusted adult and they believe that their concerns will be taken seriously when they have those relationships. So if they see something that's happening in the school, they know that they can turn to someone that they trust. Healthy social interactions between students and other students, staff and family members are also benefits of taking a classroom outdoors. Uh, there's an opportunity for risky play, especially for younger students where it's kind of an if then situation, like if I pull this petal off of a flower, what will happen to the flower in the long term of, of its life? Or if I pluck a flower, what will happen to the flower? Um, there's a direct correlation of caring for other living things when you're actually interacting with nature. Uh, in a study of a high school in Colorado, there was a gardening program that was so beneficial to relieving stress for the students that were enrolled in the class that other students would go to a guidance counselor and talk about stressful situations. And the guidance counselor would say, even though you're not enrolled in this class, go to this class, do some gardening. And that was a big help for those students as well. It was also a requirement for young mothers who found it beneficial to their self-worth because they really saw those parallels of being able to care for living things and um, their self-worth and being able to see that they can care for something else and you know they could relate that directly to their personal lives. And when you take classes outdoors, think about the areas where you're taking them. So um, are there are there birds that are available? So can you look at what's happening in the spring versus the summer versus the fall versus the winter with uh, what birds might be doing or what plants might be doing? And then in another study, it was noted that conflicts would sometimes arise between students in an outdoor uh, classroom environment but that they would not escalate and students would always be able to work them out. So really being able to negotiate those social interactions was a real benefit for outdoor education. So how are we dealing with this today in the time of COVID-19? Uh, we're really having to rethink our existing spaces and how we can leverage opportunities that may already be present and use some of those outdoor environments when our children are in school. So this is at um, Carolina Day School in Asheville, North Carolina. And what they've done is they've kind of, you know, created these stumps that are movable throughout, um, you know, an outdoor environment. And they've taken their classrooms outside. Their stumps are six feet apart. Their students are wearing masks. And they've, you know, they've just taken their learning outdoors uh, when they can. The Natural Connections demonstration was a four year English outdoor learning project. And they released strong evidence in 2016 very positive benefits of outdoor education 
Um, notably, 72% of students said that they got along better with others uh, when they had a classroom outside. In addition to that, 85% of schools saw a positive impact on behavior with moving some classrooms outside. I think those are those are pretty strong indicators that something was going right. Equally as important, or if you ask a student, likely more important uh, is the time for unstructured play. Ask any student their favorite part of the day, and I think nine times out of 10 or maybe 99 out of 100, they're going to say recess or their free period, maybe if they're an older student. Um, outdoor time gives students an opportunity to relieve pent up energy, alleviate hyperactivity. Uh, they really think of it as their time where they're making their own decisions. They have freedoms that they might not have during class time, freedom to kind of move around and wiggle a little bit more and um, just, just, be, just be more free. So looking at outdoor play and the types of, of availabilities of what there is to play on or with for students. So giving opportunity for varied play um, instead of just a swing set, maybe there's um, something that's a little bit more organic like what you see here at Joyner Park Community Center where this is actually a worm that you can crawl under or over. Uh, there's a little birdhouse uh, further off to the right in this photograph. Uh, that you know you can just kind of experience play in a different way um, where students can kind of make up their own games instead of playing on structured equipment. Uh, students typically want to play with things and not on things. So giving them an opportunity to um, really have different levels of play. It can be high intensity or low intensity and giving them a variation of what they can do in their free time. Uh, they can kind of create their own challenges and and really negotiate social interactions with each other as they're playing together. Uh, it's also good for self led exploration, discovery and imagination. Um, you know you have a ball and you're playing with it, but maybe it's not just a ball. Maybe it's a planet or um, you know any number of things. Um, it also helps to break down barriers of both you know gender and language. So if a if a girl and a boy aren't paired together in a class or a girl and another girl aren't paired together in a class, they have the opportunity to be able to play together outside. Um, or if you have a student who's uh, got English as a second language, um, I mean, play is play. So a lot of times you'll need to communicate, but playing, communicating through play is a lot easier. So it helps to break down those barriers between students. And then interesting to note is that the full benefit of play in the true sense of the word do taper off around age 12 when more social worlds begin to take over free play. But it is um, noted that all ages did show lower stress and restored mental fatigue after having a, a time for just free play. So let's talk again about bullying because this oftentimes occurs at times when teachers may not have direct supervision over each student, which a lot of times is during you know, lunch or recess or class change time. So many times bullying can occur during recess, but a lot of times it's because of boredom or pent up energy. And the staff reaction to this is to restrict the time for free play. And a lot of times this can heighten the problem. So we really need to work in, you know, every situation is different, but to find a balance that works for that class or for that school between um, surveillance and freedom and play. There was a school in Texas that tripled their recess time. So instead of having uh, one 15 minute block of recess, um, they had a 45 time period of recess, but they didn't have 45 minutes at once. It was 15 minutes at the beginning of the day, in the middle of the day, and at the end of the day. And so that broke up the class time just enough where it really made big improvements in the classes and teachers saw better focus, better listening, learning independently, problem solving, and most notably, fewer disciplinary actions. So this, uh, these are some graphics from a survey that was conducted of 500 United States elementary school teachers, and it was conducted by the Wakefield Research on behalf of the International Play Equipment Manufacturers Association. Um, 
64% of those teachers agreed that recess reduces bullying. So that kind of directly counteracts the idea that the, the unsupervised time um, enhances bullying because this is, you know, this is the free time. So I think if recess is being used in the appropriate way, that it can really help to reduce. OK, so now imagine that it's a typical work day. It's about 2.30 in the afternoon and you've really got that 2.30 feeling. You look outside, you determine that you need a break. It's a beautiful day. So you take a walk outside and you get a change of scenery. I do this all the time. Um, and in my work day, I just I need a mental break. So I'll go outside and take a mental break. Uh, research has shown that just like for adults, the same desire and need is present for students. We can't expect them to sit in a class uh, for long periods of time without taking some sort of brain break. Um, good moods are associated with outdoor environments. Even if you can't take a class out for a full class period, uh, taking time to just take your class out for a nature walk or observations at different times of year, or just having um, a time for them to go outside and read. Maybe there's a reading station outside of the media center or eat outside of the cafeteria. Um, any, any of those would help to promote this outdoor experience where you might not be relating directly with nature uh, for you know outdoor education, but you're still experiencing nature as you're in nature. Most really interesting, I think, too, about the outdoor experience is the role that it plays in the recovery after a stressful situation. Um, so if you're if you're a part of something that's stressful and then you go outside, um, it can really speed up that recovery process and kind of help overall. Uh, and the maximum benefits of that are for students with those harder personalities that are a little bit harder to crack. So um, again, getting them on on a, a more relaxed environment and being able to, you know, slowly break down those barriers that happens with um, with being outdoors as one factor. So this was from a study of um, spending how much time is uh, is really beneficial during a week to to improve health and well-being. So what this found was that if you spend at least 120 minutes a week in nature, just experiencing nature, not necessarily directly interacting with it, um, but that that has a lot of positive benefits, both for health and well-being. So what happens when it's too hot or it's too cold or it's windy? Um, Research has shown that even just exposure to views or sounds of nature have positive statistics and positive perception of place and interaction with your surroundings. So it can be visual, it can be auditory. Um, it's just, you know, can you make that connection with at least one of the senses? So in the photograph on the slide, this is an elementary school project in Hendersonville, North Carolina. It's, it's um, Edneyville Elementary School. And during the programming process of this project, what we discovered by having conversations with the staff is that on their existing site, and you can see kind of the buildings that are off to the left on this slide, on their existing site, uh, they had direct views to this large pond that was just to the north but only some of the classrooms were able to enjoy those views. So what they said would be a really nice thing is that if all of the classrooms had a view to that pond, if they could all experience kind of that really nice landscape and have those views from their classroom. So that informed the program. And so you see this arching um, floor plate that is now the new El or Edneyville Elementary School. So every classroom does have a direct view to that pond. Um, particularly important to note is that outdoor exposure is, is most beneficial at casual areas and times when um, less focus is required. So as well as with areas that are maybe not typically um, having exposure to nature, such as corridors or stairwells, um, exposure to outdoor environments really correlates to fewer behavioral incidents and reduced violence. And uh, just as a side note for any designers or planners who may be on this call, um, the 2018 North Carolina State Building Code um, states that 
stairs with four stories or less do not have to be enclosed. There are some stipulations. There are some things that you have to do, but this was um, confirmed by DOI. We had some conversations with them to make sure that we were interpreting this correctly. But what that really does is it gives you an opportunity to have more visual on um, on areas that are typically enclosed. This is even for egress stairs. So we have uh, some projects that are just finishing up construction that have no enclosed stairs. And so we have um, you know light at the end of all of our corridors and we have light in all of our stairs and it gives a really great visual connection uh, even in places where teachers don't have as much supervision typically. So even limited exposure to plants in a classroom, even if you don't have a window, if you can put plant, plants in a classroom, it still has positive effects on students. Uh, in an effort to raise awareness of bullying, IKEA promoted their Bully a Plant initiative, where two plants were put under identical conditions and they were studied for 30 days. And essentially what happened was one plant was bullied and another plant was complimented and showed kindness. And I think we can all agree that this was probably not the most scientific of experiments, but what it was really successful in doing was raising awareness and bullying and um, what a difference it can make for, um, you know, how you're treating a living thing. These images were from a study of um, housing in Chicago, Illinois. So um, people would be randomly assigned housing in this apartment building and the views varied greatly uh, depending on what side of the apartment building you were on. Um, so all areas that were adjacent to the apartment were planned to have green spaces, but some of those areas struggled and they were abandoned and redesigned with pavement. Um, participants who were in this study to kind of see what effects that had on them um, uh, were either in the uh, in, a, in, an, uh, in an apartment that had a natural view or in an apartment that had a view to the pavement. Um, everyone who was in the apartment side that had the natural views showed higher levels of patience and self-control. And then other studies indicate high rates of recovery from stressful experiences, again, when you're exposed to nature. And then when at all possible, involve students. They really want to be a part of decisions. It gives them ownership, it gives them responsibility, and it teaches them compromise and negotiation. Um, so the, the image here that you see of the brick wall, this was just something that we happened to stumble upon as we were, I think, scouting a building for photography that had just finished up construction and students had occupied the building. Um, so this is at Apex High School in Apex, North Carolina. And what we saw was this student led initiative to um, share a kind word and a smile, I think was the direction that was just written in chalk on this brick wall. And so some of these things that you see like be yourself, love yourself, your mind is beautiful. They were just so inspiring to walk by and see. And this was completely student initiated. And honestly, this is not what I think of when I think of high school students. So it was really cool to, to stumble upon this. So by, by involving students in the decision making process, you're giving them the opportunity to practice social skills, um, sharing and caring and promote positive social behaviors. And really the process is just important as the ultimate goal and students are learning about themselves as much as anything else. Um, so this image is from Khan Elementary School and our programming process there. Um, so in addition to talking to parents and community members and existing staff and faculty in this um, project where there was an existing school community, we talked to the students and what they told us was very telling. They were very aware of the issues of their school. They knew that there was a, a traffic backup with parent queuing. They also really recognized the things that were working well in their school. So they had a butterfly garden and they wanted to maintain that. They even wanted to expand it. They wanted to have um, fruits and vegetables introduced into their garden and they wanted to, to really have outdoor connections. Um, they talked a lot about recess and about having a full size soccer field. I don't think they got that, but uh, I think we did give them a lot of other things that they were asking for with their outdoor environments, including an amphitheater and a space for them to go outside to eat lunch and lots of play spaces and spaces for gardens. 
So now I want to share with you a real school where the ideas that we just talked about are successfully implemented and what that impact is that they have on the students and the staff. So to be clear, um, Clark Nexon is not the architect of this school, uh, so there's no bias here uh, for the school itself. Um, what happened in order to choose the school to do a case study on uh, was we talked with um, planners within Wake County Public School System and said, hey, this is kind of what we're studying. What do you recommend as a school? And they said immediately, oh, Douglas Elementary School, this is great. Um, and for me, it was kind of like, oh, well, that's that's really great to hear because this was actually the school that my daughter was attending. So I live right around the corner. I was able to go and kind of experience some things at the school, met with the principal on a number of occasions and learned a lot about the school. Um, and I really I really think this is a great example. Uh, so Douglas Elementary School is part of the magnet program. It's an arts and sciences uh, magnet program and it was named the number one magnet school in America in 2016. So I think we're, you know, Wake County and I are in agreement with the um, with the magnet program that this is a very deserving school. So here's the site plan and to give you a little bit of context, it's in the North Hills area. North Carolina, um, so this is just kind of a, a through road here and then all around the school is neighborhood. This is really nestled into um, neighborhoods. It's a it's a strong community feel uh, from the people in the neighborhoods and also for students who are bused in. There are about 728 students, about 37% of the students who attend this school are free and reduced lunch. 27% are Hispanic and have English as a second language. 13% are African American. 14% are IEPs or individualized educational programs, and then 34% of the students are um, from the magnet application. Um, and again, it was listed as the number one magnet school in America in 2016. So some highlights. Here's your front entry. Oh, excuse me. Here's your front entry right here. And oh, right here. Sorry. And um, a few of the outdoor environments. This is the kind of walker area. They've got a, a spirit rock here that's painted. Um, they've got several garden locations, um, several play locations, and then they have these forest areas uh, in these kind of wooded tree areas that um, are also available and they're right next to some of these um, structured play areas and they're also available for students to kind of explore and play. And then um, a recent addition is this nature trail. It's a, it's around about half of the perimeter of the site right now, and I think it's planned to um, loop the full perimeter, but right now it's only about halfway there. Um, but again, this is another outdoor environment that students um, are are invited to uh, experience with their teachers because this is a little bit more off of the uh, you know structured areas and. Um, planned areas for student play. So this is an opportunity for classes to go outside and um, kind of experience together with their teachers. So uh, I want to share a video with you all. Unfortunately, due to you know technical difficulties and being able to record this program, um, you won't hear the students talking, but I will kind of talk to what they're saying and um, hopefully convey just the level of excitement that they have about their school. So this is a class that has gone outside. <laughs> a musical playground where everyone's dreams come true. The music teacher brings the class outside here and at recess it's also available. She likes that she can make music while she's in nature. Then here's the outdoor pavilion used for reading. Science projects are also done out here if more space is needed. This is part of the younger play area. And they can use uh, dry erase markers on here or kind of, you know, have some free play and have some imagination with what's happening with these artboards. boards. 
she's talking about a math relay race where math problems were put up on this board. And it can also be used as a pull up bar. <laughs> so this is the community garden that they're showing now. Classes can volunteer to come out and plant or check on different um, items that might be growing in the garden. This is the butterfly garden. Lots of pollinator plants in here so that they could attract um, butterflies and uh, different pollinators. This is the outdoor theater. Um, it's a little amphitheater uh, and you'll see in some later photos that this has gotten quite a bit of a facelift, but the, you can fit a class out there. You can have different instruction or be used for different play area as well. And you can see it's, you know, it's recently rained, so they're not shying away from using it in different types of weather. And then this is a recess period where students are out here not playing on the structured equipment, but playing with um, some other pieces of equipment that they have out there. This is the breezeway with a really oversized chair, which is really fun for students to climb on. And here they are at the musical playground again, I'm sure creating some sort of symphony. And then what I love about this video too is just all of the smiling faces. So I'm, they might be cheesing it up a little bit for the camera, but I like to think that they're they're really happy with their school and with their learning environments. Um, so looking at the staff of the school, you know, this is um, we talked about leading by example a little bit earlier, but I think this is another example of um, of how the staff is really doing that. They're creating a really positive culture in their school. Um, so what do you think of when you say that you have to be sent to the principal's office? It's usually a, ooh, you know, kind of situation where somebody has to go down there. So you open the door and you expect to see this big desk and a stern face behind you and someone sitting in a big chair, um, you know, who's really going to discipline you. But if you look at the photo that's on the left of this slide, this is the principal's office. There's no big desk, there's no big chair, and really it's used more as a conference room. Um, so instead of having a kind of me versus you um, feel to it, it's a me and you. Let's work together and let's discuss this um, and kind of work from there. And then here's some other images that kind of show just the level of involvement of the staff with the school. So um, there are clubs and um, different uh, things that children can participate in uh, before and after school programs. These are all run by the teachers and the staff, so they're really involved with their students. They're out there in the morning in their mascot costumes, greeting students and having dance offs and really just um, integrating with the students as they come in. And then getting on their level too, you know, that the principal implemented what he was calling Fly Kicks Friday. So he would um, wear these different colored shoes. I think he has some red ones too. And, you know, just really trying to relate to students on multiple levels. So here's some examples of ownership uh, among the school. So this is some art, some wire art that was done and it was hung on the brick walls outside. This is a uh, wind chime. I think there are also some bird feeders that are similar to this, uh, and that's all throughout the campus. This was a mosaic looking at different wind patterns, and this was done by uh, fifth graders, I think, who had graduated a few years prior. But I think what's really great is that they're displaying all of these. So the students see these art projects that they've made, and it's really encouraging them to you know, help take care of their campus because they see that it's not just a building, it's their building. And I think this is my favorite. It's this this rock or river of rocks. And what happens is when you graduate uh, fifth grade from Douglas Elementary School, you paint this rock and you put it in the river and you become part of this greater um, uh, group of students who have all gone through the same thing and you officially go to middle school. So some more student ownership. I think uh, these were winners of the reflections contest and they were their uh, part of their prize was to be able to paint these sheds. So um, on the left, obviously, it's a little bit more Picasso style. And then on the right, here's the painting in progress. 
there's a lot of hands on learning in this school um, because it is the arts and science program. I think the theme um, really helps with that. Uh, so on the left, I think these are students working in the garden and then uh, in the middle and on the right, this was part of an artist in residency program where an artist came in and what they're doing is creating the bug hotel. So this is part of the um, butterfly garden where there are a lot of pollinators. And so they're inviting those pollinators to come and really take up residence in their garden. More examples of hands-on learning. Uh, on the left is an outdoor classroom, so they have these chalkboards that are set up. They're trying to make it easy for teachers to come out and use these spaces. In the middle, this is this is just on pavement. There's no chairs here, but um, all the students are looking at a notebook, uh, and it, I think it has a math equation, and they're all working on this math equation, and they've just moved it outside. And then there's an art project in process on the right. And then uh, on the left is tracing shadows and I think looking at some of the comparisons there and doing some measurements on length. And then on the right, this is a kindergartner. He's practicing writing his sight words. And so he's not outside, but he's still interacting with nature because he's got that exposure there directly through that window. Then looking a little bit closer at the musical playground, um, there are all kinds of things that make noise here. Um, but it's it's a really cool opportunity for students to just really get creative and you don't have to be an expert at anything. You can kind of bang on anything and make noise and it, it usually sounds pretty good. So looking at structured play versus unstructured play. Um, so they do have these structured playgrounds and they're appropriate for different grade levels and they are definitely used and they are enjoyed by students. But what we discovered was that unstructured play was equally or more so enjoyed by students. Um, it's free interpretive imagine, you know, imagination and discovery play. And this is uh, some of those wooded areas that I was talking about that are right off of those playgrounds. So the teachers still have supervision. They're right there. They're just on the other side of those trees. So they can still see students and students can take um, these pieces of what's called the imagination playground, these little blue pieces, um, and kind of weave them together as part of their recess time. This is the community garden. And again, there are different fruits and vegetables and pollinator plants that are planted in this garden. This garden is used as part of the curriculum of the school. Uh, so students who come out and plant carrots at one part of the season can come out and harvest the carrots at another part of the season. So they really are learning kind of what happens when you plant a seed um, and, the, and the process that it takes to grow something. Uh, this is run by parent volunteers, so this it does take a decent amount of effort. And fortunately, the school has uh, parents who are willing to put in that effort. This is also a community resource. It's not gated off. Community members can come up and participate. Uh, I guess they can harvest, you know, the fruits and vegetables as they come in. Uh, there's also uh, an area where they have some protected papers and the community can really interact with the garden. It kind of has like a little questionnaire, a little game um, to be able to play to learn more about the garden. And then in years of surplus, donations are um, offered to plant a row and backpack buddies in the Raleigh area. This is the butterfly garden. So uh, in the video, one of the students said, we created this and she was exactly right. She hit the nail on the head because this wasn't created by someone else. This, this is the students who are arranging these rocks and putting the mulch in and actually planting the plants that are in the butterfly garden. And then on the right, you can see the kind of the final product of that bug hotel, uh, which resides in the, in the butterfly garden. And this is the Peace Garden. This is close to the main entry of the school. And this was a response to um, September 11th. So you can see in the form in the photograph on the left that you know, you've got the two squares there kind of uh, resembling the Twin Towers. And then in the middle are the themes of the Positivity Project, which is um, something that Douglas um, promotes with their students. So talking about self-discipline, responsibility, courage, respect, um, among other good things. And this is also an area where when students have felt really passionately about something and have wanted to walk out in kind of a, a larger and a larger group and have their own voice, this is the area where students have been allowed to walk out of school so that they could do it in a safe way, but still really have that voice. 
And then looking at the nature trail. So again, this is kind of set a little bit further back from those play areas, um, but it's it includes stakes that show the different facets of the theory of multiple intelligences. So these stakes are set at different locations along the trail and um, kind of have a little workstation so that you can learn more about being picture smart or music smart or body smart or whatever it may be at that point on the trail. And then here's the amphitheater on the left with that facelift. They recently got this new face here. I think it was the Boy Scout um, that made it his project. And uh, instead of having the, the, the benches that were a little bit old, now they have these really nice tree stumps, which I think have resin tops and um, are really a fun place for being able to take a class or to have a little performance. And then the outdoor pavilion, which we saw in the video as well. Uh, this is a really nice area to be able to bring a classroom out. If it's a really sunny day and you need some shade, this is the place where the classes are going. And then how did they adapt for COVID-19? Uh, so their students are back in school, not at 100% capacity, but kind of rotating through on the modified plan B that Wake County had set in motion. So in the plan or in the image on the left, you see those picnic tables. This was pre-COVID-19. <clears throat> and on the right, you can see the, all the preparations that were made with kind of freshening up those spaces and painting the tables so that they would have more opportunity for um, outdoor environments and bringing classrooms outside, especially during the global pandemic. And here's the Spirit Rock, and I think this really does encompass the spirit of Douglas. Uh, they are really virtually unstoppable, and I think they've done a great job with implementing these outdoor environments. So how are we measuring, um, you know, kind of the results of all of the outdoor environments of, um, of at the school? So on the left in the pink, this is um, what we saw on an earlier slide from the study of the natural connections demonstration. And then on the right are some interview questions uh, from students at Douglas Elementary. So while we don't have the test scores and those sort of statistics to be able to compare from a time when uh, maybe the school didn't have as much integration with nature outside uh, to the time where they are spending a lot more time outside, we were able to send a survey out to students where fourth and fifth graders participated. And what really stood out was, you know, the fact that students were really aware of how much, how much um, positivity came out of being outside and spending time with nature. And so 98% of the fourth and fifth grade students that were interviewed agreed that they would really like to have more outside time during classes. And sometimes the, the most telling information is that that's unsolicited. So this is actually from uh, greatschools.com. And um, this was a, a quote from a student who had graduated from Douglas Elementary previously. And I really liked what they said, where it says, there were never any fights or problems and I never saw much bullying. And I think that's a really great way to kind of wrap up this presentation and talk about you know, relating it back to safety because that's really where this all started and it's where we want to see more schools going in the future. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to present and talk about this uh, really important topic. And um, my email address is here and I welcome any further uh, questions or conversation that anyone might like to have. And then also included on this slide is the information of the principal for Douglas Elementary, and he's also more than happy to take any kinds of questions or comments. So thank you so much, and I hope to see you all sometime soon in person.